Hey, this is Erin, your friendly ER educator, and today I'm going to do a quick lecture on implicit bias in emergency care. Um, a lot of this is super applicable to any form in healthcare, but we're going to hit on where we might see this in our workplace and how we can mitigate it. I do just want to put out a trigger warning here on some of the content. The content may cause some discomfort or distress in some individuals as we explore our own internal and implicit bias. Being un uncomfortable is okay. The goal of the activity is to explore our own biases and how we can affect patient care. It's recommended to take this knowledge and explore it further beyond just this one training. Uh, the goal is also to learn from this activity and take your knowledge back to the bedside. If you need to, pause along the way, take breaks, and really the purpose of this lecture is to provide continuing ed only. The activities presented are examples only and are not opinions of the educator or the healthcare organization. To obtain credit for this activity, you must complete the presentation, watch all of the videos, take some time to reflect, and fill out the activity worksheet with the post-test and turn it into the department educator with your completed competency forms. I will say I am not sure if the videos are going to work within this video and automatically start. If they do not, all of the links are posted on each slide and the video links are also listed on the top of your worksheet. So please follow along and watch the videos just so you can get everything out of this presentation. So grab your worksheet and follow along as we start and go through this uh, lecture series. So on the first part of your worksheet and the reflection, what do you know about implicit bias? Just take a few moments, pause the video if you need to, take a few moments and just write down what you know about implicit bias. All right, so the first video I want you to watch is called Hidden Biases. So go on to YouTube and click on or look at the following link. Just type it in and it should pull up this video. Then you're going to look at your worksheet next and do some reflection. So thinking about the young man in the video, can you relate to this story in some way? Name two examples of bias that the young man experienced. And then how did this bias impact his life and future circumstances? So make sure to write this down on your worksheet. So now that we've gotten warmed up a little bit and we've done a little activity, let's define implicit bias. What is implicit bias? Everyone has implicit bias. Bias is our attitudes, beliefs, and it can be positive or negative about other people, ideas, issues, or institutions that occur outside of our conscious control and awareness. Our implicit bias affects our opinions, decisions, and behavior, which could be our voice, our tone, our nonverbal behaviors, proximity to a patient during an exam, etc. It can lead to a negative evaluation of a person or patient based on irrelevant characteristics such as gender or race. And we're going to look at a bunch of different types of biases that we might see in healthcare. But just know that this is an unconscious outside of our control and awareness that happens within a split second. And again, everybody has bias, but we need to be very careful um, when we are examining a patient or getting to know a patient because sometimes bias can cloud our judgment and we might miss things. And I'll share a story with you a little bit later. All right, so this is your second video on unconscious bias. And again, I want you to go onto YouTube and type in the YouTube link and watch this video. And then you're gonna do some reflection after the next slide. So here's another video about gender bias, which is very prevalent, obviously, in real life media. This is from Ellen DeGeneres, and she kind of did a little spoof on this, but it's crazy ridiculous that these things are actually out in the media and we probably see them more than we realize. But again, please go onto YouTube and type in the following link so you can watch the video and then do some reflection. So on your worksheet under the third part for reflection, bias is everywhere. What did you feel after watching the two videos? Did you find yourself doing some of those things or have you done some of those things? And what did you feel about that Ellen DeGeneres clip? Do you see these types of biases in healthcare? Where do you see them? When do you see them? Just take a moment and do a little bit of reflection and write it down on your worksheet. This is your change of shift report. When you hear the following patient demographics, what comes to your mind? An 18 year old basketball player, a 78 year old veteran needing diabetic wound care, 
a 66-year-old breast cancer survivor, 55-year-old with heart failure, 22-year-old drug overdose. When I first did this activity at a training, I automatically formulated patients into my mind. And I knew in that instant that I had had some of my own biases. So what patients did you see when you heard the brief demographic descriptions? Did you make any assumptions about these patients? Like, were they non-compliant potentially? Did you pick a male or female patient? Were they young or old? Um, what did you think about socioeconomic status? Did any of those other things come into your mind? Take some time and reflect about that on your worksheet. All right, let's take a peek at implicit bias in healthcare. There are many different types of biases, and I just listed some of them here on the slide. Most biases in healthcare revolve around our vulnerable populations. So our minority and ethnic groups, sexual or gender bias, ageism, lower socioeconomic status, persons struggling with mental health, disabled persons, maybe patients that are overweight or obese, many different types of biases. Some of these are negative, most of them are negative, but they can also be positive. An example of a positive bias would be education potentially. It could be negative too, but when I think about education, sometimes I think about that being a positive. Uh, a perfect example of this would be when I was actually going through my breast cancer treatment, um, my physician assumed that I knew everything there was to know about breast cancer and treatment because I was a nurse. While I appreciated that, I know a lot about ER nursing. I don't know anything about breast cancer treatment. So treat me like a patient. Don't assume that because of my education level or because of my occupation that I know what you're talking about. And we can do this with our patients sometimes too. Your patient is coming in because they're a patient and they're struggling with a concern at that moment. So treat them like a patient. Don't assume that they know something more than they do. Um, and again, like I said, that one is just an example of a positive bias but most of these have some real negative connotations associated with them. I just wanted to share with you a few more examples about bias in healthcare, and these are very well documented in medical journals and online and some very reputable medical sources. But just some examples, African-American women, their maternal fetal death rates are significantly higher than Caucasian women. Minority persons are less likely than white persons to be given appropriate cardiac care, less likely to receive card kidney dialysis or transplants, and less likely to receive the best treatments for stroke, cancer, or AIDS. Minority persons are also more likely to receive cheaper and outdated forms of treatment in comparison to Caucasian patients. End of life care varies significantly based on culture and ethnicity. LBGTQ patients reported significantly less interactions with their child's pediatricians and their own medical provider. In general, access to care is going to differ by race, culture, ethnicity, gender identity, etc. When you look at pain management, women often report inadequate pain management compared to men. And I actually just saw a crazy video online about this male OBGYN, and he was talking about like how women um, who get a C-section have very little access to adequate pain management after they get a C-section, and male counterparts are getting, you know, 10, 15 pills of narcotic pain medication for very lesser um, serious abdominal pains or complaints or something like that. Speaking of men and boys, men and boys have significantly undertreated for mental health concerns, and some of that has to do with access to care as well and stigma. And last, medical journals, if you pay attention or close enough to them, medical journals often favor certain populations in the populations that they serve. So here are just some examples, and there are probably a million more, but just some examples that we see pretty often in healthcare where, we, where bias is very prevalent. When we explore our bias, why do we have them? A lot of our bias comes from personal experiences, your upbringing, your culture, your geographic location, sometimes a lack of exposure to diversity, 
And living in the Midwest, I think this is very applicable, lack of exposure to diversity, especially in our community, in our area. Um, we might also have bias based on, you know, just do a little bit of self-reflection here and really think about who is in your inner circle. You know, who are your go-to people? You know, from Grey's Anatomy, we say, you're my person. Who's your person? Who's in your inner circle of people? What do they look like? Is there a lot of diversity in terms of age or gender or culture within your inner circle? And then think about who are the others in your life? Is there diversity in your others? Um, media influence can also be a point of positive or negativity when we look at bias. Um, when we have media that influences our life, I mean, how often do we open up Facebook or we look at Instagram or whatever? When we're doing that, what kind of followers are we follow or people are we following? Who's following us? Do we take the time and engage in cross-cultural literature, TV, or movies to expand our thought process, expand our diversity, expand our experiences in our education? Or do we tend to follow the same people that are similar to us? We all have biases, good or bad, but these are just some of the reasons that we might have bias. When does bias occur? Bias occurs daily and sometimes minute to minute. Most of the time, bias occurs when we don't have all the information. When we don't have all the information, our brain tries to make connections to things. Um, in maybe ways that are incorrect, but it tries to make those connections to fill in the blanks. And sometimes those fill-ins are not accurate. Bias also occurs when we're under stress. Again, our brain is trying to make connections and make sense of things, and it might not always be true. Bias also can occur when we see the same patients, those frequent flyers, right? And this can be really dangerous in healthcare. I've done it. I'm sure you all have done it. You see the same person here with the same complaint for the fourth or fifth time in a row, and it's like, gosh, they've been here a million times for the same thing. If you're finding that you're doing that, it's probably a good idea to have a new set of eyes on that patient. Switch, if you've taken care of the same patient, the same frequent flyer, air quotes, um, give them to somebody else. And I say that because you know, if you have a patient that comes in and comes in and comes in, um, you know, you might miss something if you consider all the th all the times that they've come in and they're just like, oh, they've got abdominal pain. Oh, they've got abdominal pain. Oh, they've got abdominal pain. You might miss something if all you're doing is looking back at the chart and saying, oh, this guy's been here five times in the last week. And we've all done it. But if you find yourself doing that, try and give them to another provider just so you don't miss something, because that can be, like I said, it can be kind of dangerous. Bias also occurs when we care for patients of different cultures and languages. And this might just be a lack of education on our part, and so we need to be respectfully curious and ask patients what their preferences are, what we can call them, what would be an appropriate way to greet them, um, you know, if they want to have a person of the same gender in the room with them when they're getting an assessment done. And like I said, being respectfully curious and asking questions can help mitigate bias too. So just think about this and the times that you've maybe noticed some bias in yourself. When does it seem to happen? All right, so follow along on your worksheet. This is the frequent flyer case study. So a 34 year old female known very well to ER staff presents to the ER triage with a racing heart and shortness of breath. The staff know this patient frequently seeks ER care for anxiety and panic attacks. However, she hasn't been to the ER in over two months. Her vital signs are as follows, blood pressure 159 over 74, pulse of 122, respirations are 26, oxygen is 95% on room air, temperature is 98.9 Fahrenheit. Any concerns that you can think of at this point? Maybe, maybe not. Due to the patient's past experiences, the triage nurse attributes her symptoms and vital signs to anxiety, and the nurse sends her back out to triage. Are we concerned about anything? Or is this patient probably having another anxiety attack? 
I don't know. We'll see. All right, so the triage nurse assumed the patient was having another anxiety attack and failed to assess further. If the nurse had assessed further, the patient would have shared that she is three weeks postpartum and had a complicated labor, which resulted in an emergency C-section. The patient hasn't been feeling well for a few days and developed severe shortness of breath this morning. Are we still thinking anxiety attack or could it be something more? What do you think? So the patient was brought back to an available room one hour later and orders were placed by the doctor. The patient was eventually diagnosed with a PE, pulmonary embolism. So on your worksheet, do a little reflection. What could have been done differently? What was the impact on patient care? What other terms have you heard or used that could be considered derogatory or disrespectful, like frequent flyer? Fill them out on your worksheet and take a little bit of time to reflect. How does bias affect healthcare? It affects it a lot. Patient outcomes, diagnosis, care, treatment, pain management, clinical decision-making, the patient provider interactions and more can be really negatively impacted by bias. Bias affects whether or not patients will return to an organization for care. Because of bias and what patients experience, they might avoid healthcare. They might have mistrust of healthcare. They might um, not be offered the same screenings or end of life care. And really the patient's perception is reality. How they are treated can affect their healthcare outcomes. Positive bias can also affect patient outcomes. And like I mentioned this earlier with my situation, you're the nurse, you've been diagnosed with cancer, you should understand your diagnosis and you might even be talked to differently. Another example is that Asians are smarter and should understand their diagnosis. So negative and positive bias can severely affect patient outcomes. How do we assess our own bias? Well, we do things like this and we reflect. Self-reflection is super important. One, you have to recognize that you have bias. Two, try and see another perspective. Put yourself in your patient's shoes or somebody else's shoes. Be respectfully courteous and seek new understanding. Try and have a respectfully inquisitive approach to new experiences, new people, etc., and have an open mind. Another thing that you can do is actually take the Harvard bias test, and there's 17 of them. They're free, um, and they will help you understand and discover your biases. Um, some examples of the tests are biases on topics such as disability, gender, race, and age. You can review your results against other demographic results and reflect on, on the test and what it may or may not reveal within yourself. After you're taking the test, you might feel uncomfortable and you might disagree, but you just have to remember that the tests are not conclusive of any absolute bias you ha might have, but it's a good opportunity to self-reflect and potentially uncover any implicit bias. The other thing we can do is really try and raise our, raise our cultural awareness. I think it's a good idea, especially again, living in the Midwest, we don't have a lot of cultural diversity but maybe exposing yourself to some more cultural diversity and taking the opportunity to go, you know, visit a church group in your area or go, you know, drive to the cities or something where you're going to come across a population that's different than your demographic and try and learn about that culture. Uh, there's plenty of resources online to also raise your cultural awareness. We even have them in the My Learning modules. Um, so take some extra time and just kind of raise your own cultural awareness a little bit. All right, this is your last video. It's called Putting People Into Boxes. So please go onto YouTube and type in the following link and then grab your worksheet and do some reflection and answer the questions based on this video. On your worksheet, when you first saw the people walk into the building and into the assigned boxes, did you make assumptions or did you create anything in your mind about them? Did you automatically assume how they were going to be grouped? Were you surprised to see certain people come forward when the questions were asked? And lastly, what happens when we place people in boxes? And this can be in your own life or in healthcare. 
How can we mitigate bias? Well, there are things that we can do within ourselves to mitigate bias where we can do the Harvard tests, we can do self-reflection, we can you know, expand our inner circle, but there's tons of strategies too that you can do within the workplace, like I said, in my learning, and then things you can do online to really engage in other cultures and just to raise your own awareness. How do we mitigate bias in ourselves? Well, an easy way to do that is to use the acronym IMPLICIT. So I, introspection, take some time to do some self-reflection and introspection about your own biases. Maybe figure out what your biases are. Be really mindful and give yourself some grace while you're doing this. P for perspective, you know, put yourself in your other person's shoes or your patient's shoes. Take time to sit down and listen to your patient. Learn to slow down and reflect before you act or say anything. This next one is really important. I, individualize your care. Don't put people in boxes. Don't clump them together. Individualize your care. You don't want to miss something. C, check your message. And again, that goes with learn to slow down and think before you act or say things. Check your message. Make sure that it's not um, going to exclude anyone. Make sure that it's appropriate. Make sure that you use institutionalized fairness. And then take two. Take two breaths. Take two minutes. Slow down. And just really think about what you're doing and saying before you do it. All right, how can we mitigate bias in the workplace? Don't stereotype patients. Don't put them into boxes. Individualize your patient care. Listen to your patient. Take a moment. Ask all the questions. Don't just assume anything. Take a different perspective. Again, put yourself in their shoes. Understand that this is an emergency for them. They are sick. This is not their best day. Take a different perspective. Take a different perspective too if you're seeing that you're having, you know, the same interactions with those same frequent flyer type patients. Take a different perspective, have somebody else put a different set of eyes on them so you don't miss anything. Follow evidence-based practice. Use data to drive decisions. Don't use assumptions. Create transparency within the organization. Encourage that employees have a voice and they're able to speak up to their leaders. Hold leaders accountable. Leaders should be holding employees accountable and we should be holding each other accountable. And then it's a good idea to attend bias trainings such as this or other things that I have suggested in, or in previous uh, slides. So your last reflection, what information did you learn today that you can take into your future practice? In conclusion, we all have biases, good or bad. Our biases affect our attitude, demeanor, presence, behavior, etc. Biases affect how we provide health care. The goal of this training was to recognize our bias, realize how it impacts patient care, and how we can mitigate bias in the future to improve patient care and outcomes. Thank you so much for taking the time to reflect and think about this sensitive topic.